Hello? Ralph Waldo Emerson, self-reliant. Ne te quesiveris extra. Do not seek for things outside yourself. Man is his own star, and the soul that can render an honest and a perfect man commands all light, all influence, all fate. Nothing to him falls early or too late. Our acts, our angels are, or good or ill, our fatal shadows that walk by us still. Epilogue to Beaumont and Fletcher's Honest Man's Fortune. Cast Lebanthling on the rocks, suckle him with the she-wolf's teat. Wintered with the hawk and fox, power and speed be hands and feet. I read the other day some verses written by an eminent painter which were original and not conventional. The soul always hears an admonition in such lines. Let the subject be what it may. The sentiment they instill is of more value than any thought they may contain. To believe your own thought, to believe that what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men, that is genius. Speak your latent conviction, and it shall be the universal sense. For the inmost in due time becomes the outmost, and our first thought is rendered back to us by the trumpets of the last judgment. Familiar as the voice of the mind is to each, the highest merit we ascribe to Moses, Plato, and Milton is that they set at naught books and traditions, and spoke not what men but what they thought. A man should learn to detect and watch the gleam of light which flashes across his mind from within, more than the luster of the firmament of bards and sages. Yet he dismisses without notice his thought, because it is his. In every work of genius we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. Great works of art have no more affecting lesson for us than this. They teach us to abide by our spontaneous impression with good-humored inflexibility than most what the whole cry of voices is on the other side. Else tomorrow a stranger will say with masterly good sense precisely what we have thought and felt all the time, and we should be forced to take with shame our own opinion from another. There is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself for better, for worse, as his portion. That the thought the wide universe, that though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground which is given him to till. The power which resides in him is new in nature, and none but he knows what that is which he can do, nor does he know until he has tried. Not for nothing one face, one character, one fact makes much impression on him, and another none. This sculpture in the memory is not without pre-established harmony. The eye was placed where one ray should fall that it might testify of that particular ray. We but half express ourselves and are ashamed of that divine idea which each of us represents. It may be safely trusted as proportionate and of good issues, so it be faithfully imparted. But God will not have his work made manifest by cowards. A man is relieved and gay when he has put his heart into his work and done his best. But what he has said or done otherwise shall give him no peace. It is a deliverance which does not deliver. In the attempt his genius deserts him. No muse befriends, no invention, no hope. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Accept the place the divine providence has found for you, the society of your contemporaries, the connection of events. Great men have always done so, and confided themselves childlike to the genius of their age, betraying their perception that the absolutely trustworthy was seated at their heart, working through their hands, predominating in all their being. And we are now men, and must accept in the highest mind the same transcendent destiny, and not minors and invalids in a protected corner, not cowards fleeing before a revolution, but guides, redeemers, and benefactors obeying the almighty effort, and advancing on chaos in the dark. What pretty oracles nature yields us on this text, in the face and behavior of children, babes, and even brutes, 
That divided and rebel mind, that distrust of a sentiment because our arithmetic has computed the strength and means opposed to our purpose, these have not. Their mind being whole, their eye is as yet unconquered, and when we look in their faces, we are disconcerted. Infancy conforms to nobody, all conform to it, so that one babe commonly makes four or five out of the adults who prattle and play to it. So God has armed youth and puberty and manhood no less with its own piquancy and charm, and made it enviable and gracious and its claims not to be put by, if it will stand by itself. Do not think the youth has no force, because he cannot speak to you and me. Hark, in the next room his voice is sufficiently clear and emphatic. It seems he knows how to speak to his contemporaries. Bashful or bold, then, he will know how to make us seniors very unnecessary. The nonchalance of boys who are sure of a dinner and would disdain as much as a lord to do or say ought to conciliate one is the healthy attitude of human nature. A boy is in the parlor what the pit is in the playhouse, independent, irresponsible, looking out from his corner on such people and facts as pass by, he tries and sentences them on their merits, in the swift, summary way of boys, as good, bad, interesting, silly, eloquent, troublesome. He cumbers himself never about consequences, about interests. He gives an independent, genuine verdict. You must court him. He does not court you. But the man is, as it were, clapped into jail by his consciousness. As soon as he has once acted or spoken with eclat, he is a committed person, watched by the sympathy or the hatred of hundreds, whose affections must now enter into his account. There is no lethe for this. Ah, that he could pass again into his neutrality. Who can thus avoid all pledges having observed, observe again from the same unaffected, unbiased, unbribable, unaffrighted innocence must always be formidable? He would utter opinions on all passing affairs, which being seen not to be not private but necessary, would sink like darts into the ear of men and put them in fear. These are the voices which we hear in solitude, but they grow faint and inaudible as we enter into the world. Society everywhere is in conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. Society is a joint stock company in which the members agree, for the better securing of his bread to each shareholder, to surrender the liberty and culture of the eater. The virtue in most request is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. It loves not realities and creators, but names and customs. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. He who would gather immortal palms must not be hindered by the name of goodness, but must explore if it be goodness. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Absolve your, you to yourself, and you shall have the suffrage of the world. I remember an answer which, when quite young, I was prompted to make to a valued advisor who was wont to importune me with the dear old doctrines of the church. On my saying, what have I to do with the sacredness of traditions if I live wholly from within, my friend suggested, but these impulses may be from below, not from above. I replied, they do not seem to me to be such, if I am the devil, but if I am the devil's child, I will live then from the devil." No law can be sacred to me but that of my own nature. Good and bad are but names very readily transferred to this or that or this. The only right is what is after my constitution, the only wrong what is against it. A man is to carry himself in the presence of all opposition as if everything were titular and ephemeral but he. I am ashamed to think how easily we capitulate to badges and names, to large societies and dead institutions. Every decent and well-spoken individual affects and sways me more than is right. I ought to go upright and vital and speak the rude truth in all ways. If malice and vanity wear the coat of philanthropy, shall it pass? If an angry bigot assumes this bountiful cause of abolition and comes to me with his last news from Barbados, why should I not say to him, Go love thy infant, love thy woodchopper, be good-natured and modest, have the grace and never varnish your hard, uncharitable ambition with this incredible tenderness for black folk a thousand miles off. Thy love afar is spite at home. 
Rough and graceless would be such greeting, but truth is handsomer than the affectation of love. Your goodness must have some edge to it, else it is none. The doctrine of hatred must be preached as the counteraction of the doctrine of love when that pules and whines. I shun father and mother and wife and brother when my genius calls me. I would write on the lintels of the doorpost, whim. I hope it is somewhat better than whim at last, but we cannot spend the day in explanation. Expect me not to show cause when I seek or why I exclude company. Then again, do not tell me, as a good man did today, of my obligation to put all poor men in good situations. Are they my poor? I tell thee, thou foolish philanthropist, that I grudge the dollar, the dime, the cent I give to such men as do not belong to me and to whom I do not belong. There is a class of persons to whom by all spiritual affinity I am bought and sold. For them I will go to prison if need be. But your miscellaneous popular charities, the education at College of Fools, the building of meeting houses to the vain end which many now stand, alms to sots, and the thousandfold relief societies, though I confess with shame I sometimes succumb and give the dollar, it is a wicked dollar which by and by I shall have the manhood to withhold." Virtues are, in the popular estimate, rather the exception than the rule. There is the man and his virtues. Men do what is called a good action as some piece of courage or charity, much as they would pay a fine in expiation of daily non-appearance on parade. Their works are done as an apology or extenuation of their living in the world, as invalids and the insane pay a high board. Their virtues are penances. I do not wish to expiate, but to live. My life is for itself and not for a spectacle. I much prefer that it should be of a lower strain, so it be genuine and equal, than that it should be glittering and unsteady. I wish it to be sound and sweet, and not to need diet and bleeding. I ask primary evidence that you are a man, and refuse this appeal from the man to his actions." I know that for myself it makes no difference whether I do or forbear those actions which are reckoned excellent. I cannot consent to pay for a privilege where I have in intrinsic right. Few and mean as my gifts may be, I actually am, and do not need my own assurance or the assurance of my fellows any secondary testimony. What I must do is all that concerns me, not what the people think. This rule, equally arduous, in actual and in intellectual life, may serve for the whole distinction between greatness and meanness. It is the harder because you will always find those who think they know what it is your duty better than you know it. It is easy in the world to live after the world's opinion. It is easy in solitude to live after our own. But the great man is he who in the midst of the crowd keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. The objection to conforming to usages that have become dead to you is that it scatters your force. It loses your time and blurs the impression of your character. If you maintain a dead church, contribute to a dead Bible society, vote with, great, with a great party either for the government or against it, spread your table like base housekeepers, under all these screens I have difficulty to detect the precise man you are. And of course, so much force is withdrawn from your proper life. But do your work and I shall know you. Do your work and you shall reinforce yourself. A man must consider what a blind man's bluff this game of is this game of conformity. If I know your sect, I anticipate your argument. I hear a preacher announce for his text and topic the expediency of one in the institutions of his church. Do I not know beforehand that not possibly can he say a new and spontaneous word? Do I not know that with all his, this ostentation of examining the grounds of the institution, he will do no such thing? Do I not know that he has pledged to himself not to look but at one side, the permitted side, not as a man but as a parish minister? He is a retained attorney, and these heirs of the bench are the emptiest affectation. 
Well, most men have bound their eyes with one or another handkerchief and attached themselves to some one of these communities of opinion. This conformity makes them not false in a few particulars, authors of a few lies, but false in all particulars. Their every truth is not quite true. Their two is not the real two, their four not the real four, so that every word they say chagrins us, and we know not where to begin to set them right. Meantime, nature is not slow to equip us in the prison uniform of the party to which we adhere. We come to wear one cut of face and figure and acquire by degrees the gentlest asinine expression. There is a mortifying experience in particular which does not fail to wreak itself also in the general history. I mean the foolish face of praise, the forced smile which we put on in company where we do not feel at ease in answer to conversation which does not interest us. The muscles, not spontaneously moved, but moved by a low usurping willfulness, grow tight about the outline of the face with the most disagreeable sensation. For nonconformity, the world whips you with its displeasure, and therefore a man must know how to estimate a sour face. The bystanders look, bystanders look askance on him in the public street or in the friend's parlor. If this, this aversion had its origin in contempt and resistance like his own, he might well go home with a sad countenance. But the sour faces of the multitude, like their sweet faces, have no deep cause, but are put on and off as the wind blows and a newspaper directs. Yet is the discontent of the multitude more formidable than that of the Senate and the college. It is easy enough for a firm man who knows the world to brook the rage of the cultivated classes. Their rage is decorous and prudent, for they are timid as being very vulnerable themselves. But when to their feminine rage the indignation of the people is added, when the ignorant and the poor are aroused, when the unintelligent brute force that lies at the bottom of society is made to growl and mow, it needs the habit of magnanimity and religion to treat it, treat it godlike as a trifle of no concernment. The other terror that scares us from self-trust is our consistency, a reverence for our past act or word. Because the eyes of others have no other data for computing our orbit than our past acts, and we are loath to disappoint them. But why should you keep your head on your shoulder? Why drag about this corpse of your memory, lest you contradict somewhat you have somewhat you have stated in this or that public place. Suppose you should contradict yourself. What then? It seems to be a rule of wisdom never to rely on your memory alone, scarcely even in acts of pure memory, but to bring the past for judgment to, into the thousand-eyed present and live ever in a new day. In your metaphysics you have denied personal personality to the deity, yet when the devout motions of the soul come yield to them heart and life, though they should clothe God with shape and color, leave your theory as Joseph his coat in the hand of the harlot and flee. A foolish constancy is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by statesmen and philosophers and divines. With consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. He may as well concern himself with his shadow on the wall. Speak what you think now in hard words, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again, though it contradict everything you said today. Ah, so you shall be sure to be misunderstood. Is it so bad, then, to be misunderstood? Pythagoras was misunderstood, and Socrates, and Jesus, and Luther, and Copernicus, and Galileo, and Newton, and every pure and wise spirit that ever took flesh. To be great is to be misunderstood. I suppose no man can violate his nature. All the sallies of his will are rounded in by the law of his being, as the inequalities of Andes and Himalaya are insignificant in the curve of the sphere. Nor does it matter how you gauge and try him. A character is like an aristocratic or Alexandrian, an acrostic or Alexandrian stanza. Read it forward, backward, or across, it still spells the same thing. In this pleasing, contrite, wood life which God allows me, let me record day by day my honest thought without prospect or retrospect, and I cannot doubt it will be found symmetrical, though I mean it not and see it not.
My books should smell of pines and resound with the hum of insects. The swallow over my window should interweave that thread or straw he carries in his bill into my web also. We pass for what we are. Character teaches above our wills. Men imagine that they communicate their virtue or vice only by overt actions, and do not see that virtue or vice emit a breath every moment. There will be an agreement in whatever variety of actions, so they be each honest and natural in their hour. For of one will the actions will be harmonious, however unlike they seem. These varieties are lost sight of at a little distance, and at a little height of thought. One tendency unites them all. The voyage of the best ship is a zigzag line of a hundred tacks. See the line from a sufficient distance, and it straightens itself to the average tendency. Your genuine action will explain itself, and will explain your other genuine actions. Your conformity explains nothing. Act singly, and what you have already done singly will justify you now. Greatness appeals to the future. If I can be firm enough today to do right and scorn eyes, I must have done so much right before as to defend me now. Be it how it will, do right now. Always scorn appearances, and you always may. The force of character is cumulative. All the foregone days of virtue work their health into this. What makes the majesty of the heroes of the senate and the field, which so fills the imagination? The consciousness of a train of great and great days and victories behind. They shed a united light on the advancing actor. He is attended as by a visible escort of angels. That that is it which throws thunder into Chatham's voice and dignity into Washington's port and America into Adam's eye. Honor is venerable to us because it is no ephemeris. It is always ancient virtue. We worship it today because it is not of today. We love it and pay homage because it is not a trap for our love and homage, but is self-dependent, self-derived, and therefore of an old immaculate pedigree, even if shown in a young person. I hope in these days we have heard the last of conformity and consistency. Let the words be gazetted and ridiculous henceforward. Instead of the gong for dinner, let us hear the whistle from the Spartan fife. Let us never bow and apologize more. A great man is coming to eat at my house. I do not wish to please him. I wish that he should wish to please me. I will stand here for humanity, and though I would make it kind, I would make it true. Let us affront and reprimand the smooth mediocrity and squalid contentment of the times, and hurl in the face of custom and trade and office the fact which is the upshot of all history, that there is a great responsible thinker and actor working wherever a man works, that a true man belongs to no other time or place, but is the center of things. Where he is, there is nature. He measures you, and all men, and all events. Ordinarily, every body in society reminds us of somewhat else, or of some other person. Character, reality, reminds you of nothing else. It takes place of, of the whole creation. The man must be so much that he must make all circumstances indifferent. Every true man is a cause, a country, and an age, requires infinite spaces and numbers and time fully to accomplish his design, and posterity seem to follow his step, steps as a train of clients. A man Caesar is born, and for ages afterwards we have a Roman Empire. Christ is born, and millions of minds so grow and cleave to his genius that he is confounded with virtue and the possibility of a man. An institution is the length and shadow of one man, as monachism, of the, as the monachism of the hermit Antony, the Reformation of Luther, Quakerism of Fox, Methodism of Wesley, abolition of Clarkson, Scipio, Milton called the height of Rome, and all history resolves itself very easily into the biography of a few stout and earnest persons. Let a man then know his worth and keep things under his feet. Let him not peep or steal or skulk up and down with the air of a charity boy, a bastard, or an interloper in the world which exists for him. 
But the man in the street, finding no worth in himself which corresponds to the force which built a tower or sculpted a marble god, feels poor when he looks on these. To him a palace, a statue, or a costly book have an alien and forbidding air, much like a gay equipage, and seem to say like that, Who are you, sir? Yet they are all his, suitors for his notice, petitioners to his faculties, that they will come out and take possession. The picture waits for my verdict. It is not to command me, but I am to settle its claims to praise. That popular fable of the sot who is picked up dead drunk in the street, carried to the duke's house, washed and dressed and laid in the duke's bed, and on his waking treated with all obsequious ceremony like the duke, and assured that he had been insane, owes its popularity to the fact that it symbolizes so well the state of man, who is in the world a sort of sot, but now and then wakes up, exercises his reason and finds himself a true prince. Our reading is mendicant and sycophantic. In history our imagination plays us false. Kingdom and lordship, power and estate are a gaudier vocabulary than private John and Edward in a small house and a common day's work. But the things of life are the same to both. The sum total of both is the same. Why all this deference to Alfred and Scanberg and Gustavus? Suppose they were virtuous. Did they wear out virtue? As great, as great a stake depends on your private act today as followed their public and renowned steps. When private men shall act with original views, the luster will be transferred from the actions of kings to those of gentlemen. The world has been instructed by its kings, who have so magnetized the eyes of nations. It has been taught by this colossal symbol the mutual reverence that is due from man to man, the joyful loyalty with which men have everywhere suffered the king, the noble, or the great proprietor to walk among them by a law of his own make, and he may, by his own, make his own scale of men and things, and reverse theirs, pay for benefits not with money but with honor, and represent the law in his person, was the hieroglyphic by which they obscurely signified their consciousness of their own right and comeliness, the right of every man. The magnetism which all original action exerts is explained when we inquire the reason of self-trust. Who is the trustee? Who is the aboriginal self on which a universal reliance may be grounded? What is the nature and power of that science-baffling star without parallax, without calculable elements, which shoots a ray of beauty even into trivial and impure actions, if the least mark of independence appear? The inquiry leads us to that source, at once the essence of genius, of virtue, and of life, which we call spontaneity or instinct. We denote this primary wisdom as intuition, whilst all later teachings are tuitions. In that deep force, the last fact behind which analysis cannot go, all things find their common origin. For the sense of being which in calm hours rises, we know not how, in the soul, is not diverse from things, from space, from light, from time, from man, but one with them, and proceeds obviously from the same source whence their life and being also proceed. We first share the life by which things exist, and afterwards see them as appearances in nature, and forget that we have shared their cause. Here is the fountain of action and of thought. Here are the lungs of that inspiration which giveth man wisdom, and which cannot be denied without impiety and atheism. We lie in the lap of immense intelligence, which makes us receivers of its truth and organs of its activity. When we discern justice, when we discern truth, we do nothing of ourselves but allow a passage to its beams. If we ask whence this comes, if we try to pry into the soul that causes, all philosophy is at fault. Its presence or its absence is all we can affirm. Every man discriminates between the voluntary acts of his mind and his involuntary perceptions and knows that to his involuntary perceptions a perfect faith is due. He may err in the expression of them, but he knows that these things are so, like night and day, not to be disputed. My willful actions and acquisitions are but roving. The idlest reverie, the faintest native emotion, command my curiosity and respect. Thoughtless people contradict as readily the statement of perceptions as of opinions, or rather much more readily, for they do not distinguish between perception and notion. 
the fancy that I choose to see this or that thing. The perception is not whimsical, but fatal. If I see a trait, my children will see it after me, and in course of time all mankind, although it may chance that no one has seen it before me, for my perception of it is as much a fact as the sun. The relations of the soul to the divine spirit are so pure that it is profane to seek interpose helps. It must be that when God speaketh, he should communicate, not one thing, but all things, should fill the world with his voice, should scatter forth light, nature, time, souls from the center of the present thought, and a new date and new create the whole. Whenever a mind is simple and receives a divine wisdom, old things pass away, Means, teachers, texts, temples fall. It lives now and absorbs past and future into the present hour. All things are made sacred by relation to it, one as much as another. All things are dissolved by their center, their center by their cause. And in the universal miracle, petty and particular miracles disappear. If, therefore, a man claims to know and speak of God and carries you backwards to the phraseology of some old moldered nation in another country, in another world, believe him not. Is the acorn better than the oak, which is its fullness and completion? Is the parent better than the child into whom he has cast his ripened being? Whence, then, this worship of the past? The centuries are conspirators against the sanity and authority of the soul. Time and space are but physiological colors which the eye makes, but the soul is light. Where it is, is day. Where it was, is night. And history is an impertinence and an injury, if it be anything more than a cheerful apologue or parable of my being and becoming." Man is timid and apologetic. He is no longer upright. He dares not say, I think, I am, but quotes some saint or sage. He is ashamed before the blade of grass or the blowing rose. These roses under my window make no reference to former roses or to better ones. They are but for what they are. They exist with God today. There is no time to them. There is simply the rose. It is perfect in every moment of its existence. Before a leaf bud has burst, its whole life acts. In the full-blown flower, there is no more. In the leafless root, there is no less. Its nature is satisfied, and it satisfies nature in all moments alike. But man postpones or remembers. He does not live in the present, but with reverted eye laments the past, or, heedless of the riches that surround him, stands on tiptoe to foresee the future. He cannot be happy and strong until he too lives with nature in the present, above time. This should be plain enough, yet see what strong intellects dare not hear, dare not yet hear God himself unless he speak the phraseology, I know not what David or Jeremiah or Paul. We shall not always set so great a price on a few texts, on a few lives. We are like children who repeat by rote the sentences of grandams and tutors, and as they grow older of the men of talents and character they chance to see, painfully recollecting the exact words they spoke. Afterwards, when they come into the point of view which those who had uttered these sayings, they understand them and are willing to let the words go, for at any time they can use words as good when occasion comes. If we live truly, we shall see truly. It is easy for the strong man to be strong as it is for the weak to be weak. When we have new perception, we shall gladly disburden the memory of its hoarded treasures as old rubbish. When a man lives with God, his voice shall be as sweet as the murmur of the brook and the rustle of the corn. And now at last the highest truth on this subject remains unsaid, probably cannot be said, for all that we say is the far-off remembering of the intuition. That thought by which I can now nearest approach to say it is this, when good is near you, when you have life in yourself, it is not by any known or accustomed way. You shall not discern the footprints of any other. You shall not see the face of man. You shall not hear any name. The way, the thought, the good shall be wholly strange and new. It shall exclude example and experience. You take the way from man, not to man. All persons that ever existed are its forgotten ministers. Fear and hope alike beneath it. There is somewhat low even in hope. 
In the hour of vision, there is nothing that can be called gratitude nor properly joy. The soul, raised over passion, beholds identity and eternal causation, perceives the self-existence of truth and right, and calms itself with knowing that all things go well. Vast spaces of nature, the Atlantic Ocean, the South Sea, long intervals of time, years, centuries, are of no account. This which I think and feel underlay every former state of life and circumstances, as it does underline my underlie my present, and what is called life, and what is called death. Life only avails, not the having lived. Power ceases in the instant of repose. It resides in the moment of transition from a past to a new state, in the shooting of the gulf, in the darting to an aim. This one fact the world hates, that the soul becomes. For that forever degrades the past, turns all riches to poverty, all reputation to a shame, Confa confounds the saint with the rogue, shoves, G shoves Jesus and Judas equally aside. Why then do we prate of self-reliance? Inasmuch as the soul is present, there will be power not confident but agent. To talk of reliance is a poor external way of speaking. Speak rather of that which relies because it works and is. Who has more obedience than, masters, than I masters me, though he should not raise his finger? Round him I must revolve by the gravitation of spirits. We fancy it rhetoric when we speak of eminent virtue. We do not see that virtue is height, and that a man or a company of men, plastic and permeable to principles, by the law of nature must overpower and ride all cities, nations, kings, rich men, poets, who are not. This is the ultimate fact which we so quickly reach on this, as on every topic, the resolution of all into the ever-blessed one. Self-existence is the attribute of the supreme cause, and it constitutes the measure of good by the degree in which it enters into all lower forms. All things real are so by so much virtue as they contain commerce, husbandry, hunting, whaling, war, eloquence, personal weight, are somewhat, and engage my respect as examples of its presence and impure action. I see the same law working in nature for conservation and growth. Power is in nature the essential measure of right. Nature suffers nothing to remain in her kingdoms which cannot help itself. The generation, genesis and maturation of a planet, its poison orbit, the bended tree recovering itself from the strong wind, the vital resources of every animal and vegetable are all demonstrations of the self-sufficing and therefore self-relying soul.